The Civil Rights Movement is an incredibly important time in our nation's history. The basic rights of an American citizen have yet to be afforded to all people. Righteous anger has been rising in the U.S. Legendary icons in the African-American community make themselves known in the 1950s and 60s. Individuals such as MLK, Malcolm X, and Rosa Parks are the most well-known by the public, and their legacy is immortal. It's important to note that while great vocal leaders are key for any movement, what's even more necessary is accomplishing change. One of the early victories for the civil rights movement in the mid-20th century was the Montgomery bus boycotts. Rosa Parks famously refused to give up her seat on the bus for a white passenger. The citizens of Montgomery revolted and refused to board the buses until they were desegregated in 1956. If Rosa Parks was the face of the boycotts, Claudette Colvin was the heart and soul. Claudette Colvin made a stand identical to Rosa Parks nine months earlier. On top of that, she was a part of the Supreme Court case that officially integrated the buses of not just Alabama, but the entire United States. I'm Matt Dahlberg, and Claudette Colvin is a hidden gem of history. Usually, I take this time to give proper context to the hidden gem. I start by stating how they grew up and what led them to be the person that made a difference in the world. It usually takes me a couple of paragraphs, but for Claudette Colvin, I can do it with just one sentence. As a 15-year-old student from Booker T. Washington High School in Montgomery, Alabama, Claudette Colvin was a typical poor black girl of that time. This isn't to disrespect Colvin, but makes what she accomplished in her lifetime all the more special. Additionally, it highlights how her bravery is unmatched in a time where boldness often led to tragedy. On March 2nd of 1955, Claudette Colvin left school, paid her fare, and boarded the bus just like any other day. Colvin sat in the colored section. Public transportation was segregated, as was nearly all of Alabama during this time. As more and more passengers got on, Claudette, along with her entire row, was asked to stand up and give their seats to a white woman boarding. Initially, a pregnant woman by the name of Ruth Hamilton refused, prompting Claudette to do the same. They had paid for their seats and would not budge. The driver called the police. Seeing that Miss Hamilton was pregnant, the officers did not forcefully remove her. They convinced others to shuffle seats, allowing Ruth to sit once again. For Claudette, no grace was given. She was commanded again by two officers to stand and move to the back of the bus. Claudette refused. In an excerpt from a biography detailing her life, Colvin recalls, We couldn't try on clothes. You had to take a brown paper bag and draw a diagram of your foot and take it to the store. Can you imagine all of that in my mind? My head was just too full of black history. You know, the oppression that we went through? It felt like Sojourner Truth was on one side pushing me down, and Harriet Tubman was on the other side of me pushing me down. I couldn't get up. The police then dragged her off the bus, sat her in the back of the squad car, and took her to the local jail. Colvin protested loudly, making a scene for all to hear. She was quoted as yelling, It's my constitutional right. She didn't fight back against the two men, nor did she curse. She wanted to make sure there was no reason for the cops to retaliate. In what must have been the scariest car ride of her life, Claudette Colvin was hauled off, locked in a cell, and was given no phone call. According to Colvin, during the drive, the two officers did everything they could to upset her. They tried to guess her bra size. They called her names I won't dare repeat, and joked about how, they were taking her to the women's penitentiary. Claudette was able to keep some semblance of cool by praying quietly in the car. Luckily, someone who had witnessed the incident contacted her mother, who, along with their pastor, picked up the frightened child from the police station. While Claudette did not spend the night behind bars, in her mind, the ordeal was not over. 
Colvin feared she may be attacked, sexually assaulted, or lynched. Many people had died for much, much less. After the incident on the bus, more people started to follow in Colvin's footsteps. Several more women in Montgomery were asked to stand up and move to the back for white passengers. All refused and were arrested, including the most famous example, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was the leader of the local NAACP in Alabama, and Colvin knew her from NAACP Youth Council meetings. Parks was chosen over Colvin as the face of the movement for a few different reasons, some of which I understand and completely agree with. Others seem ridiculous and borderline just insulting to Colvin. A valid reason for not publicizing Claudette was her age. At 15, the spotlight would be overwhelming for a teenage girl, and extremely dangerous. While clearly a bright pupil, it would be irresponsible to rip her from her school to go on tour promoting civil rights all around the country. Her mom even preferred Rosa over her, at least in the sense of being the face of a movement, telling Claudette, let Rosa be the one. White people aren't going to bother Rosa. They like her. There was the other matter of Rosa Parks had finished her education and was already in a position of leadership and was used to the attention and the threats. The other reason, some stated by Claudette, but others by her community were, let's say, less convincing. This mostly comes down to the image of Colvin versus Parks. Some of the criticisms of the teen included her hair not being good enough and her skin not being fair enough. In other words, part of the reason she was judged is she was too black. There was another problem. After the incident, Claudette's life got more difficult. She was pregnant. While never confirmed, rumors spread that she had been with a married man and that's who got her pregnant. This seemed to be the last straw for the NAACP and other civil rights organizations. They propped up parks and unfortunately Claudette was mostly shunned by her community for being an alleged homewrecker. Despite the scorn cast upon her, Claudette Colvin's story does not end here. During the boycotts, civil rights attorney Fred Gray was looking at each arrest in Montgomery, Alabama, trying to find the sturdiest cases to bring before federal courts. At first, Parks appeared to be the obvious choice, but for whatever reason, Fred Gray believed that there was a high likelihood they would run into a dead end and ultimately passed on her. Gray re-examined the Claudette Colvin case and decided to represent her and four other women in what would later be known as the momentous Browder v. Gale ruling by the Supreme Court. While stronger than Rosa Parks' case, this was no slam dunk. It would take strong testimony, along with the best and brightest attorneys available. Luckily for Colvin, and the other plaintiffs, the legal counsel was second to none. Fred Gray was a former preacher, but would go on to represent Martin Luther King Jr., and later Rosa Parks. He was aided by Robert L. Carter, who would become a federal judge in New York, and Thurgood Marshall. Now that name might sound familiar. Marshall was the very first African-American Supreme Court Justice. The plaintiffs may have had great lawyers, but they still had to overcome a great deal of hate and harassment. One of the plaintiffs, Janetta Reese, felt so much pressure she recanted her testimony and claimed she never agreed to be part of the lawsuit. This caused an awful fallout and nearly disbarred Fred Gray. However, the move proved to be largely ineffective as the four other plaintiffs, including Colvin, held firm in their testimony. They won at the federal level by a decision of 2-1, to one, and the Supreme Court denied the appeal from the city of Montgomery. It was a great victory for civil rights but Claudette still had that same stigma of infidelity attached to her that kept her from truly being embraced by civil rights leaders. Only recently has this changed even slightly, possibly because of some of the backlash she faced at the time, and partly because she didn't want to take anything away from Rosa Parks. 
she didn't share her story until a decade and a half ago. Rosa was her mentor, and she respected her greatly. She would never want to disrespect someone who meant so much to her and what she fought for. It's really too bad more people don't know of Claudette Colvin. By today's standard, she would have been everything I would want leading a movement. And what's more, she better represented the average American fighting for their civil rights. A 15-year-old girl should have been perfect. She was mild-mannered when she had to be, but rightfully indignant when the time called for it. Some of the most iconic people in social movements just in the past couple of years have been teenagers. Greta Thunberg, who is known for spreading awareness for climate change, was also just 15 when she burst onto the political zeitgeist. Most of the civil rights movement was populated with people like Claudette. The movement was full of brave young people, much younger than the average civil rights leader like King or Parks. Claudette loved learning, and especially African American history, in high school. And it's a shame it hasn't been as kind to her. She deserves to be treasured and praised. Claudette Colvin is a hidden gem of history. If you have someone in mind who you think should be highlighted as a hidden gem of history, or just want to learn about an undervalued time in history, feel free to email the show at hiddengemsofhistory at gmail.com with your suggestion. Hidden Gems of History could not be made without the help of so many people. This episode especially could not be made without Claudette Colvin and the book Twice Toward Justice by Philip Hoos, where I gathered most of my research. It may seem redundant, but I have to shout out Claudette Colvin for the simple fact that she's still alive. Her days of working in a nursing home are long behind her. She retired in 2004 and is 80 years young at the time of this recording. By listening to this podcast, you're helping Claudette Colvin be remembered as the civil rights hero she is. Thank you. I'm Matt Dahlberg, and this has been Hidden Gems of History.